Wait, how are the duckers in the shot? There. Oh, yeah. what? <laughs> there were a couple of innovations in the way that we approached Thanos' facial work. Mm, that shark wave. We had one version that was much bigger. Maybe you've discovered something that we didn't even intend to put in the movie. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to another very special episode of Visual Effects Artists React. Today we are joined by Matt Aitken. Now Matt is one of the visual effects supervisors at Weta, and it's an incredible honor to have him here on the show. He's worked on a ton of movies, everything from Avengers Endgame all the way back to Lord of the Rings. He was in our Lord of the Rings special. But I'm the guy scanning the cave <laughs> troll with the, with the really early laser scanner. That's so. so cool. Tell us a little bit about what your role is. What does it mean to be a visual effects supervisor? My role is that I'm the, kind of the contact point between the team at Weta Digital, you know, producing the visual effects work on, on, a, on a given show, and the people at the studio. Like, I work with the team at Marvel on the Avengers films. I'm providing, you know, the finished visual effects shots to them to go into their movie. So, like, when you you go to the dentist and you have like the nurse that like works for a while on your teeth and then the dentist comes in just like touches everything briefly at the very end. Is that you basically? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Endgame was actually nominated for an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. We're also nominated for the BAFTA which is the British oh. Academy of Film and Television Awards. So I get to fly to London, <laughs> go to the BAFTAs and then come back here next week for the Oscars. Oh wow. Who knew that a career in visual effects was so uh, star studded and... So jet city. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Usually Posh it's not. And... <laughs> yeah. One of the scenes that you guys were responsible for in Avengers Endgame was the climactic end battle scene. Yeah, that was pretty much what we did. Our work started when Thanos turns up in, in the 8 ship and destroys the Avengers compound, and we go all the way through to Tony doing the snap and his ultimate demise. S spoilers ahead, <laughs> <laughs> you somehow haven't seen this movie. Wait till you see this next one. Hard. Everybody dies. Do, 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 do. Not everybody. I think it worked. This was a pretty shocking moment in the movie. It's like, oh, okay. Oh. It's like, and roll credits. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that shockwave. That giant explosion. We worked on that a lot because it had to look like it was going to create this huge crater, but at the same time, it couldn't look like it just blew them all to pieces. <laughs> so we had one version that was much bigger. They were like, yeah, that's great, but nobody could survive that. <laughs> And is that all CG fire? Was it all dynamics and simulation? Yep, yeah, for sure. We shared the shot with ILM, so at a certain point here, it becomes an ILM shot. They did all this work here. We did all the, the outside stuff. You should talk to them. I'm sure they'd love to come in as well. They'd be like, hey, I applied for an internship a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you hire me? <laughs> I'm always impressed by the level of consistency between all the different effects houses mm. delivering mm. the same character in different scenes worked on by completely different people. Yeah, the team at Marvel, they do a lot of work in terms of giving us each notes. We'll show a version of Thanos and they'll like aspects of it and they'll, they'll take that shot and show it to DD and then, you know, we'll share geometry and we'll share textures. You know, they're completely different assets. So there are two completely different 3D models of Thanos yep. that are brought up to the exact same level of quality, so you can't tell the difference between them. Well, that's what we tried to achieve. I mean, <laughs> I'd say you succeeded. I didn't realize there were multiple different versions. <laughs> if you enjoyed the show and you want to keep watching, well, please consider subscribing so that it shows up in your subscription feed and you never miss an episode. I thought by eliminating half of life, the other half would thrive. So when you have a character like Thanos, Yep. who is completely digital, but obviously driven by a real actor. What are the main steps between him acting and what we finally see in the movie? He'll be wearing a suit that's marked up, so we'll get his body performance from that. And we'll also dot up his face. He'll be wearing a head-mounted camera rig. They're filming the dots on his face as he performs. Often what we do is we'll do motion capture that is happening at the same time as live-action photography. So through infrared motion capture, we can capture the suit dots without polluting the light that the, right. the director of photography is creating on the set. I feel like a lot of people <laughs> misunderstand how motion capture works in movies. They just kind of assume that the motion is captured and then it's just applied to a 3D model and that's all you have to do. In reality... That would be, that would be amazing if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> motion capture really plays to creating his movement, but the number of times that we have raw motion capture data going onto Thanos is zero. We need to clean it up, but we also need to just find Thanos in the motion capture performance. 
some of these fight beats weren't actually Josh. A stuntman is performing the more dramatic movements and we're motion capturing the stunty. But even then, he's still not going to move the same way as an eight foot tall muscle bound right. Thanos would move. So the fantastic animation supervisor at Weta, Sydney Combo Contombo, he would dial in what he would call the body mechanic of Thanos. So he's getting the weight and maybe slowing down the movement a little. That's something that we'll keyframe on top of the motion capture data as well. When you're dealing with this much armor on a character, it can be really hard to animate all of it and have it move correctly and slide over itself without clipping. Yeah. So some people pointed out to us in this one shot of his glove, you can see his finger bits clip through the I know. fitting a little bit. Oh. I know, we missed that. Oh no. Is that, <laughs> yeah. So that's something that just nobody happened to see it until it was out in theaters? Yeah. I, mean, I wish we'd caught it at the time. <laughs> it just goes to show there's always a little bit more that you could do. But yeah, no, we're doing a lot of work on the armor. You don't want to constrain what Josh is doing on set. You want him to be able to perform. And then you just have to make the armor work to that. So there's a lot of sleight of hand going on, bending of things that should be rigid. It comes back to that thing of craft, you know? Bringing an artist's hands-on craft approach to sculpt that suit. I'm gonna enjoy it very, very much. Can we talk about Thanos' face for a moment? Sure. Do the pores stretch? <laughs> oh, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of innovations in the way that we approached Thanos' facial work. Up until Infinity War, we would go straight from the facial motion capture of Josh to the performance of Thanos. But what we started doing on Infinity War was introducing this intermediary step, which we call the actor puppet. We've got the footage of Josh from the head-mounted cameras. We've got a digital Josh, and then we've got our digital Thanos. And we can see very clearly if it's deviating a little bit from what Josh was doing. And then it's actually a reasonably straightforward process to migrate the animation curves from one puppet to the next. So what you're telling me is that <coughs> there's a perfect digital double of Josh Brolin that you can drop into every Thanos <laughs> shot in the movie. Kind of a little bit like a Mission Impossible pull off the mask. Yeah. <laughs> What's harder in your opinion, the mouth or the eyes? I think people mainly look at the eyes. That's often a criticism of digital performance. If it's not working, that people say that the eyes look dead. So we have to get the eyes right. And we spend a lot of time lighting the eyes so that they have a nice highlight. So we'll put a special light in the scene and it's a little small area light, but quite bright. Then the eyes will pick it up. It'll have a very subtle effect over the rest of him. So green screen. You guys are using a lot of green screen in this, as well as rotoscoping. Yeah. How are you getting such perfect edges in your green screen? I mean, they're like good green you? screens. They're well lit and they're clean. And then we've got a lot of really highly advanced techniques. We're you know doing parts of the hair differently. You know, if we get something really gnarly, so you might have to match move in a digital version of the actor and replace the plate hair with CG hair. Wow. When your helmet comes off there, is that CG hair for a brief moment for the ponytail to flip? I think that's just a warp, actually. And yeah. I think she might have flicked her head. That's, that's the Howard the Duck shot. Wait, Howard the Duck is in this shot? Right. <laughs> there. Oh, <Yeah>. what? <laughs> 17 frames of him, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> in one of the studio reviews, they were like, oh, wouldn't it be great to get Howard the Duck in the movie somewhere? So wow. we had to migrate this asset. You know, they sent us the Howard the Duck Luma had done for Guardians 2. They gave him one of the Ravager guns. Just way too big for him. But <laughs> I just noticed that each of those portals have like a different color scheme inside yeah, of it, yeah. and it represented the Infinity Gauntlet with ah. the different colors. Yeah, I never noticed that before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because you, you know, you've got Wakanda, you've got the blue of deep space. Maybe you've discovered something that we didn't even intend to put in the movie. <laughs> if you guys want to see us react to any specific movies or TV shows, please leave a comment in the description below. Let us know, and we will take a look at it. I don't, I don't think anyone's ever seen just so many like heroes on screen at a single time. The filmmakers, you know, they manage to balance all that stuff so that um, it's personal. A lot of it is, um, is these little beats, you know, where we get these character moments. Changing hammers. No, no, give me that. You, you have, have the little, little one. one. <laughs> and we get, you know, the reunion of Tony and Spidey. It's, that's the stuff that makes it successful. You know, we're, we're just really there supporting these, these fantastic character moments. So out of this entire sequence that would have worked on, what do you think was probably the most challenging single shot of the entire sequence? There's a little shot called the wanna. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most scary part of the cut for a long time for me, but now I can enjoy it. <laughs> So 
so many layers of complexity. Everything from clashing armies to digital yeah. doubles to animation to like real life meeting CG at the same time to explosions. To the giant monsters. We started working on it really early on and it was one of the last shots we finished. So we had a, like a sub team oh, wow. working on it. It had its own animation supervisor, its own animation team who are building the elements of the shot, populating the scene. We're iterating the whole time. So as soon as there's anything that's even half decent, we'll pass that down the line to, to lighting. So all that lighting work is, is going on at the same time as the animation work. What's really nice about this is that the characters are, are rimlit by the sun. So you have to really coordinate where the light is. So do you work up like a master lighting position going into a lot of this stuff? One thing we do do, which is what, exactly what they do on set or on location, is don't worry about the, any sort of consistency to the position of the sun, the key, the key light. So they'll always put that behind the, um, the character that they're filming. The thing I like to show people that really explains that is it's a scene from the very end of the first Independence Day movie. <laughs> the sun is always behind everybody. Yeah, which you'd kind of have to do because if you were filming it from the other side, they would just be completely burnt out. So you're, you're exposing for the shadows. We try and adopt these principles because they're established cinematographic principles that work. For these scenes here, they actually film on a practical set, but do you end up having to replace any of the foreground elements? Yeah, sometimes we do. There's a little bit of a set element behind these guys here, which we kept because it was appropriate, but we did this thing where we essentially lifted the actors off the set and put them in a predominantly CG environment. <laughs> no um, way. That sounds like a lot of rotoscoping. So you basically cut out each character and none of the background is real, just the characters are real. Exactly. Oh boy. Yeah. Wow. Obviously, um, Tony, his suit CG. So whenever we see him by himself, really the only thing we're keeping is his head anyway. And I am Iron Man. This was the last shot that we delivered on the show. Oh, at, wow. And it was about two weeks before the premiere. So it was getting... <laughs> It was coming, coming down to the wire. It's down to the line there. You know, they had versions of the shot, but they kept wanting it to change a bit, so we were happy to keep working on it. The thing that was really important in the end was showing that Tony is suffering all this damage, because ultimately it's going to kill him. Mm -hmm. And so we had to know that he was making a huge sacrifice. But also it couldn't be so flashy that it distracted away from his performance. We had some of those, um, those arcs of energy cr crawling right up into his face more. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, you just looked at that, you didn't look at him. Right, you really have to be with him in this moment. You've so. got to be with him, exactly. So I feel like you guys had a big creative challenge here with Iron Man dying and that you need to show that the wounds are fatal but you can't be so gory or grisly as to not make this a family film. Exactly. And that was something we explored for a long time through concept art to start off with. And it's a little bit similar to the snap. We had to allow him to retain his dignity through this, through this moment. How much of this was uh, makeup versus digital? It's entirely digital. So, so he has no makeup on him on set at all. He's exactly. Just... And that was a really good decision that they made to do it that way because if they had put prosthetics on him, essentially they would have been locked in to that look. Yeah, you and get more flexibility by doing it digitally, especially when you know you can achieve a photorealistic result. Yeah, I mean, it sort of relies on that. I read that uh, most of the wounds are actually just two-dimensional tracks as opposed to full 3D. Yeah, exactly. We match moved his head, but we found that his facial performance was so subtle that we could, just using like optical flow type techniques, warp the digital prosthetic onto the movement of his face so we didn't have to try and match move his facial performance. The other thing was for us, we had to sit on the secret for six or eight months. Oh gosh, yeah. And it was like, oh my God, if this leaks, we are done. <laughs> yeah, am I in trouble? <laughs> a little. We can keep a secret here. We've never had a leak, touch wood. We just have to get, get down and do it. And they were totally on board with us. And it was a total surprise for, for audiences worldwide. Can you speak about anything coming up down the pipeline at Weta? Um, well, we're, we're working on the Black Widow movie, which, okay. which opens soon. We, you know, we have an ongoing relationship with, with Marvel and it's fantastic, you know. The work that they, they get us engaged in is challenging and diverse and, you know, they're great films. There's, a, there's this great kind of like storytelling that's going on with the MCU that is just really exciting to be part of. Wow, well, that's been a crazy episode. They're getting all this information straight from the source. Whenever we're sitting here on the couch, most of the time we're kind of just guessing. So to actually hear a true professional like 
say exactly how you achieved some of these incredible results is really cool to hear. I mean, I've watched some of your stuff and you guys are pretty onto it, so. <laughs> well, that's really good to hear. <laughs> um, if you want to learn more about Weta, uh, go check out their website, you know, at wetafx.co.nz. There's articles on how some of these effects are done, lots of great information, so do not discount just going and checking out that website. It's, it's, it's great to be here. Oh, thank yeah. you, Matt. I yeah. really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, 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 I thought you were a ghost. It's really spooky for a second there because we're in here hunting ghosts for our next corridor video. But in the meantime, Tiny Guns 2 just dropped on the Corridor YouTube channel. If you're not familiar with it, it's where we put all of our short films. So go check it out. And this time, you give us a reaction in the comments below. Go check it out. YouTube.com slash Corridor. <laughs>